Hello, everyone. May I have your attention, please? Welcome to Creative Bow Lab's new webinar. Creative Bow Lab is a CRO providing services such as in vitro screening of siRNA and antisense oligonucleotide and development of viral vector based gene delivery system, especially the vaccina virus vector, herpes simplex virus vector, adenovirus vector and adeno-associated virus vector. Our scientists have years of experience providing reliable services to customers worldwide. As you may be aware, the theme of today's webinar is gene therapy, a popular technique that utilizes genes to treat or prevent certain inherited disease and acquire disease. There is currently some ongoing research that focuses on different approaches to gene therapy, such as gene silencing, mutation repairing, and gene and genetically modifying immune cells to target specific molecules. And our speaker today, Dr. Marquita Landry, has been looking for optimal therapeutic intervention time points of SINRA-based Huntington's disease therapies. Dr. Landry's team has developed a near-infrared catecholamine nanosensor, or NIR-CAT, and use it to image hot spots of dopamine activity in the striatum of R62HD model mice. She will introduce her research and findings in more details during the presentation. Dr. Marquita Landry is an assistant professor in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering Department at the University of California, Berkeley. She is also on the Scientific Advisory Board of Terramera and Chi Botanic. Her research achievements have earned her more than 20 early career awards. It is our great pleasure to have Dr. Landry present her recent findings in our okay. webinar series today. Just before Dr. Landry starts her presentation, I would like to quickly remind our audience that we will also have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please type your questions into the Q&A panel it is at the bottom middle of the window next to participant panel. And Dr. Landry will get to them after her talk is finished. Now let's welcome Dr. Marquita Landry. Dr. Landry, thank you for presenting your exciting findings to us today. You may begin when you're ready. All right, thank you so much for the invitation. Let me quickly set up my slides here. All right, so I'm excited to present today some of the work that my lab has been doing uh, in the development of uh, both assessment tools and uh, delivery technologies uh, to identify optimal therapeutic time points uh, with a specific focus on Huntington's disease. And so first, a brief introduction to my lab. My lab is largely a nanotechnology lab and I like to think of nanotechnology as uh, providing a new dimension to the periodic table. We typically like to think of materials as having very fundamentally set properties. Uh, and indeed, as we go across and down the rows and columns of the periodic table, things like electron valency or atomic mass typically dictate the properties of those materials. However, size provides a third dimension to the periodic table, where as we make materials smaller and smaller, they take on properties that did not exist at their macroscopic counterparts. So for example, the very high tensile strengths and surface area to volume ratios of nanoparticles makes them ideal for the delivery of genetic cargo, such as DNA, RNA, and even uh, proteins uh, that can traverse very difficult to cross membranes, uh, such as the plant cell wall, and even our own cell membranes, uh, upon which many of the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines are based. 
Nanomaterials also take on unique optical properties at this nanoscale. And this is what I'll be mostly talking about today, which is that when we take carbon-based materials and make them small, specifically below 100 nanometers, they become fluorescent. And they become fluorescent in a wavelength range that is maximally transparent to tissues, bone, uh, and even uh, brain tissue. We can make then uh, probes that are selectively responsive uh, to small molecules, such as chemical neurotransmitters and neuromodulators, implant these probes into the brain, and then watch as the brain chemically communicates um, with, uh, with itself between neurons, and then study how this chemical communication starts going awry in neurodegenerative disease. And so the tools that we have at our disposal, broadly speaking, to study the brain, and indeed many of the reasons uh, that we know so much about the brain uh, today, is because there's been a lot of information provided by structure and connectivity. So anatomical mapping, cell mapping, circuit mapping, to allow us to understand how the unique three-dimensional organization of neurons in the brain uh, constitutes broader, higher function. These cells are also uh, mostly electrically active. So neurons in the brain are going to communicate with each other through logic gated signals known as action potentials that allow cells to communicate information through these circuits. Now, of course, the electrical activity of cells um, isn't directly communicated between cells because cells don't physically touch each other. Instead, there's usually a synapse or a gap uh, between cells that has to be communicated chemically as opposed to electrically. And this is where the chemical activity of neurons becomes very important because as an, elect as an electrical signal causes a cell to uh, exhibit an action potential, this causes the release of chemical neurotransmitters or neuromodulators into the extracellular space. And it is these molecules that are responsible for communicating information very quickly. Now, unlike chemical neurotransmitters that transmit information between just two synapses, Chemical neuromodulators, such as dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin, are thought to diffuse outside of the synapse and modulate broader networks of neuronal activity. And so you can see here that the probability of release can actually be quite low. So if we take the electrical activity of cells as a proxy for their chemical activity, this can be a vast overrepresentation of chemical activity, and this has consequences for how we assess things like uh, neuron activity in neurodegeneration. So I'll start my talk today by focusing on dopamine, uh, explain how it is that we develop these optical probes, how it is that we validate their use in brain tissue to study uh, neuron to neuron chemical signaling, and then uh, show you an example of how we've studied neurodegeneration to identify time points at which dopamine signaling first starts to go awry. And so first, it's important to think about why it's been so difficult to develop chemical tools to study neurocommunication in the brain. The first is a chemical selectivity problem where these molecules that the brain uses to communicate are actually very different, like each having its own language. But from an analytical chemistry standpoint, their structures are very similar, so they're quite difficult to tell apart. So any probe that we use to image chemistry in the brain has to have the requisite selectivity to be able to differentiate something like dopamine versus something like epinephrine. The physics is also challenging. I won't talk about this much today, but the regions of the body in which we want to take these measurements are occluded by thick brain tissue, a thick cranium, and are just very inaccessible. And so if we want to study something like neurodegeneration, by proxy, we have to open the brain to look inside, which is a very invasive procedure. And so the advantages of implementing nanomaterial-based probes are twofold. First of all, like I mentioned before, the unique properties of nanomaterials make them very responsive to the environment. So for example, single-walled carbon nanotubes, which is the basis of our probes, actually take on semiconductor properties at the nanoscale. These nanotubes measure one diameter, uh, one nanometer in diameter, and the presence or absence of certain molecules can change their brightness due to exciton-based recombination frequencies. And so what this means is that these uh, carbon nanotubes are exceptionally photostable. They don't blink, they don't photo bleach. Um, and so that makes them very amenable for long-term imaging in the brain. The second uh, interesting figure of merit is that this fluorescence occurs in the tissue transparency window. So this is 
uh, an optical window in which brain tissue and even the brain cranium uh, is maximally transparent. And the reason for this is because the fluorescence emission of these probes falls right after tissues and bone would absorb photons and right before water starts absorbing these photons. So photons are by no means completely transparent, but they're maximally transparent if we want to do fluorescence imaging. And so that takes it uh, into consideration the advantages of near-infrared fluorescence for imaging in the brain. Um, however, we also need to address that chemistry problem on the molecular selectivity side of things. So here we have a signal transducer, a carbon nanotube, and we want to make it selective for something like dopamine. So what we do is we create a library of amphiphilic polymers. These are polymers that have hydrophobic and hydrophilic domains that can adsorb onto the surface of a nanotube. If you're familiar with the concept of protein engineering, this is very similar, where instead of engineering a protein, we're engineering a synthetic polymer. We make a large library of these polymers that will adsorb to the carbon nanotube surface and form these molecular recognition domains. Now we don't know which polymers are going to be good molecular recognition elements for which analytes, and so we have to screen a large quantity of them. But the concept is that at least one of these uh, polymer carbon nanotube constructs is going to be selective enough to allow a specific analyte, such as dopamine, to perturb the surface of the carbon nanotube, causing a signature shift or change in the intensity of the carbon nanotube that we can use as a signal for the presence or the absence of dopamine. And so this is a project that's been carried out by Abraham Vienne, who is now a professor um, and a group leader at the HHMI Genelia Research Campus, uh, who is working on the development and implementation of these probes uh, in different model organisms. When Abraham started the lab, we had this concept, again, of using a large library of these nanosensor candidates and then screening it against an analyte library that would be representative of where we want to perform these imaging experiments. So as I mentioned before, um, if we are interested in dopamine, the relative brain region is the striatum, which contains all of these small molecules, signaling molecules, except for norepinephrine or epinephrine. And so the goal here is to screen the candidate nanosensors against the analytes and identify hits or carbon nanotube polymer dopamine complexes that selectively modulate the fluorescence of the nanotube and therefore can be used for striatal dopamine imaging. And so what are some of the important characteristics here? Uh, first of all, we want to have a dynamic range that's relevant, again, for imaging the striatum. We want the response of the probe to be very quick within seconds uh, and to go back down to baseline in the absence of dopamine. The selectivity and sensitivity, again, is brain region dependent, but as I showed in the previous slide, it requires selectivity against all of the molecules noted except for norepinephrine. And so our initial dopamine hit is being depicted here. Uh, required or uh, comprised a polymer of GT polynucleotides uh, repeated 15 times that surround a carbon nanotube surface. And as you can see here, we're validating with microfluidic immobilization of this probe that addition of dopamine causes a modest 80% increase in dopamine fluorescence. Importantly, removal of dopamine causes the fluorescence to go back down to baseline. I won't go through all of the details here, but from this initial hit, we now have some information about what causes dopamine sensitivity. So then we perform a series of quantum mechanical and molecular dynamic simulations to increase the selectivity, the sensitivity, and the dynamic range of the probe to where we need it to be for in-brain imaging. This is accomplished through iterations of simulations and new library generation that fundamentally inform us about the kinetics required to accomplish imaging uh, in striatum. And so this is an example of how we go from an in silico approach to a screening approach to an in vivo compatible probe. And so again, cutting out the details, uh, you can appreciate here that our initial hit um, was again, this 15 repeat GT polymer on a carbon nanotube that showed a modest 80% increase in, in fluorescence upon addition of dopamine. The optimized sensor that came out of all of these optimizations was a truncated GT polymer repeat, but only six times, uh, that causes a uh, several thousand percent increase in fluorescence uh, in dopamine's presence. Uh, and so this is the probe that we continue with uh, in terms of validating sensitivity and selectivity. 
Again, without giving too many details here uh, in the interest of time, the selectivity of the probe uh, can be assessed by characterizing it against the panel of small molecule neurotransmitters and neuromodulators uh, that are relevant for imaging in the striatum. As you see here, the change in fluorescence is specific to dopamine and norepinephrine, but if we are going to use this probe in the striatum, norepinephrine is not present. And so we have the requisite selectivity and sensitivity, as shown here on the right, to use this probe in the striatum to study dopamine imaging. Now, secondly, because this is a probe that is responsive to catecholamines, such as dopamine and norepinephrine, uh, we've named this probe a near-infrared catecholamine, or near-cat nanosensor for short, as it will be referred to for the remainder of the talk. One quick note on the selectivity, as you're seeing here, this is the raw data of the fluorescence spectrum of NearCat upon addition of dopamine shown here in this red trace. If we instead add tyramine or octopamine, uh, which uh, octopamine is a norepinephrine analog and tyramine uh, differs by dopamine by the presence of a single hydroxyl group, we don't observe any statistically significant modulation in NearCat fluorescence. So just to, an example uh, to show the raw data, uh, with regards to how selective this approach can be, um, especially when working uh, with challenging molecules to distinguish. And so next in collaboration with uh, Professor Linda Wilbricht uh, in the Department of Psychology here at UC Berkeley, we sought to validate the probe to enable uh, it to image dopamine signaling in the brain. And the way we approach this was uh, by extracting brain tissue from mice, uh, making acute coronal slices that contain the dorsomedial striatum, uh, and then incubating these slices with the near cap probe to label the fluorescence probe in brain tissue. We can then remove excess probe and validate that the probe embeds and localizes in the extracellular space of the brain tissue, um, and then use infrared microscopy to image the, uh, this probe inside the brain tissue. So here I'm showing an example video of what the data looked like. Um, here you're seeing a snapshot of the striatum that's been labeled with NearCat. And you can see where we stimulate uh, electrically uh, the brain tissue to cause the release of dopamine into the extracellular space. And so what you're seeing here is the increase in fluorescence, which is the response of NearCat to dopamine release. Um, and then the decay in the fluorescence uh, is the reuptake kinetics of dopamine back into neurons through dopamine transporters. We can first validate that we observe increases uh, in dopamine release with increased stimulation strength as uh, we would expect. Um, and I won't show this data, but we can also uh, cause uh, or express channel rhodopsin in dopaminergic uh, projections and with optogenetics uh, um, cause dopamine release in the striatum uh, through which we see the, the same results. Lastly, we can also um, add a uh, dopamine reuptake inhibitor, uh, such as nomofensin. This is an or a pharmacological agent that's going to inhibit dopamine uh, reuptake and slow it down. And as you can see here, uh, in the presence of nomofensin under the same stimulation conditions, uh, we observe larger dopamine putative release sites and also a slower reuptake uh, kinetic process as we would expect. And so what we're observing here, uh, again, um, is very similar to what we would get uh, in terms of data with fast scan cyclic photometry, uh, which is an electrochemical technique uh, that involves the incorporation or embedding of an electrochemical probe that allows for dopamine measurements in brain tissue. However, this is a probe that will sample hundreds of individual terminals at once and average the results together. Whereas with NearCat, we're observing what we believe to be uh, do individual dopamine release sites. Uh, where each of these sites measures on average two microns, um, suggesting the diffusion beyond a single release site of, of dopamine from, uh, from a single release site. Now, um, one of the reasons that it's attractive to use, um, for example, uh, purely synthetic techniques, uh, such as polymers and nanomaterials, uh, is that when we build probes based on endogenous receptors, um, such as GPCRs um, specific for, uh, or dopamine receptors, um, those receptors are going to be also sensitive and incompatible with pharmacology that is ubiquitously used uh, both to treat certain uh, neuropsychiatric disorders, um, but also to study the fundamental mechanisms of these receptors in dopamine regulation. And so one of the tests that we wanted to do was to assess whether this near cap probe was compatible with pharmacological agents. And so to this end, 
uh, what we did was we added bath applications of sulpuride to the assay that I presented previously, uh, which is a dopamine receptor, D2 receptor antagonist, and is going to play the role of increasing synaptic dopamine. We also tested Quinpril, uh, which is mostly a research drug. It's a D2 and D3 receptor agonist, and it's going to play the role of decreasing synaptic dopamine. And so we wanted to see whether, again, first, whether our probe was compatible with pharmacology, and next, whether we could implement pharmacology in these assays to learn something about uh, their effects on dopamine release and reuptake kinetics. And so first, we performed some in vitro measurements just to confirm that uh, various uh, D2 and D3 uh, receptor agonists and antagonists would not change the fluorescence of our Nearcat probe, which is what's shown here. We also validated that in the presence of these various agonists and antagonists, we could still observe uh, a dopamine uh, change in dopamine fluorescence of near cat probe that is not statistically significant from uh, dopamine by itself. Following this, uh, we can repeat our uh, ex vivo brain slice experiments, again, where we label brain slices containing the striatum with near cat probe. We can stimulate that slice uh, electrically in ACSF and observe uh, the classical release and reuptake modulation of the fluorescence of the probe. If we back apply Quinpril, we see that we observe uh, a diminished, if not decreased, um, response. We can then wash out the drug and confirm that we recover the initial fluorescence uh, pre-drug addition 15 minutes post washout. And so, as I mentioned before, this is the type of data that we'd be able to, uh, to get with fast scan cyclic voltometry, an average view of how a sample of brain tissue is responding to these drugs. However, one of the advantages of using a fluorescence-based technique, especially one that has high spatiotemporal resolution due to the nanoscale dimensions of the probe, is in the ability to assess per release site how these drugs are affecting brain tissue. And so if we instead plot the data in a different way, instead of averaging over all of these uh, putative release sites, if we ask what each release site is doing as in response to the drug, we get a slightly different answer. So here on the left, what I'm plotting is the, uh, the response of each hotspot uh, to the drug, where a change in fluorescence ratio represents the initial fluorescence response of a hotspot versus its response post addition of quinpril. And so a change in fluorescence ratio of one would signify that the drug has no effect on that hotspot. As you can see, most hotspots respond exactly as we would expect them to uh, for a quinpril bath application, which is to decrease the amount of dopamine or the fluorescence of the probe. However, as you can see, there's a non-negligible number of hotspots that actually have the opposite response, that upon addition of Quinpril, we see an increase in their fluorescence response. What these data suggest uh, is that um, uh, D2 autoreceptors, which were previously believed to be expressed only presynaptically, might actually be expressed postsynaptically as well. This tool might also be use, uh, useful to, to validate the relative expression densities uh, pre versus postsynaptically in different brain regions. Uh, and interestingly, when we move outside uh, of the, uh, uh, the DLS, uh, dorsolateral striatum, we observe very different effects in DMS, which is more uh, a medial uh, region of, of, of the, uh, the striatal tissue. Um, so I won't go into those details, but I think it's important first to appreciate that with the level of synaptic resolution that we can use this probe for, we can start asking very different questions than we could with ensemble average techniques such as uh, fast scan cyclic voltometry or microdialysis. And so as a quick aside, um, because um, there is more than just dopamine that's involved in neurodegeneration uh, and a slew of, um, of conditions that could be uh, treated and ameliorated with gene therapy applications, I did want to mention um, that you know, one of the drawbacks of the technique here is that it's a screening-based approach. So whenever we get a request to generate a probe for something other than dopamine, it's usually very difficult to know whether this screening approach is going to take days or weeks if we are lucky and get a hit, or months and years if we are unlikely and are unable to generate a, a probe um, that is selective and sensitive enough for use in the brain. And so we asked a different question, which is whether or not these probes could be evolved for molecular recognition, combining some of the advantages, uh, again, of uh, the concept of protein engineering and bringing it to synthetic nanomaterials. 
And so for this end, or to this end, we uh, sought to develop a probe for serotonin, which is one that we've been screening for for years, uh, but unable to generate a selective probe for. Serotonin has many complementary roles to, dro to dopamine uh, in terms of behavior, uh, learning, and memory, but in addition, uh, is responsible uh, and the target of uh, pharmacologically um, many ailments such as depression and anxiety. To develop this probe, what we did was we generated first a really large uh, DNA single-stranded library of random sequences, so 10 to the power of 10 unique sequences, and conjugated these polymers to the carbon nanotube in the presence of serotonin. So the concept here is that only the trimolecular interactions between the random DNA polymers, carbon nanotubes and serotonin, would perform or would have these tight binding associations. And then we can remove polymers um, that don't bind well. We can then forcibly collect the good sequences that bind all three, amplify those, sequence those, and repeat the cycle as many times as needed for the requisite sensitivity and selectivity towards serotonin. And so we can perform this set of experiments uh, for the experimental library, which contains the polymers, serotonin, and carbon nanotubes, again, where serotonin is the target analyte. And we can also evolve a control library that is exactly the same, except doesn't have serotonin. So this library is going to tell us which DNA sequences bind the carbon nanotubes well, but not necessarily serotonin. We can then perform multiple iterations of sequencing um, and uh, if necessary amplification to continue the cycle as many times as needed for the requisite sensitivity and sel selectivity. When we plot the sequence in PCA or principal component analysis space, we can start seeing a divergence in the populations of DNA libraries for the experimental versus the control group. And this tells us that we have uh, basically repeated the cycle enough times to get a probe for serotonin. Lastly, what we can do is we can then test whether the addition of uh, serotonin indeed causes a modulation in the fluorescence uh, of the carbon nanotube polymer construct in a way that is separate or distinct in the experimental group versus the control group. So as you can see here in round three, four, five, and six of evolution, we see increasing sensitivity of the DNA sequences that are the top 10 most prevalent for the experimental group. And we see a modest uh, but statistically insignificant increase uh, in the sensitivity of the control group towards serotonin. And so what this data suggests is that we are able to synthetically evolve molecular recognition using this approach. Um, and with an approach that I don't have time to talk about today, we can implement machine learning algorithms and augmented analysis uh, to mine the data that is generated at each step of evolution to create sensors that are exceptionally, um, exceptionally bright responders towards any target analyte. And lastly, we can validate that this again works in brain tissue uh, by adding um, exogenously or endogenously stimulating serotonin release uh, from, uh, from uh, excised brain tissue that's labeled uh, with this probe. And so um, now coming back to kind of the core focus of, of the talk, which is the concept that these probes could be useful uh, for understanding how the brain communicates uh, in the neurotypical sense, which is what I've shown up until now, but also how this communication starts to degenerate uh, in neurodegenerative disorders. Um, we are going to focus exclusively again on imaging dopamine here, as you'll see its uh, central relevance in certain uh, neurodegenerative conditions. Uh, but again, as I've shown, uh, we could de uh, deliver uh, generate and use these probes uh, for a variety of different neurochemicals and neuromodulators using this evolution approach. And so coming back to dopamine, uh, dopamine is a neuromodulator uh, who orchestrates or that orchestrates uh, neurocommunication in the brain. So specifically, as I mentioned before, uh, the striatum is a part of the brain that is very rich in dopaminergic projections uh, that, uh, that usually uh, then project out to motor centers. And so dopamine orchestrates uh, much in, in the memory and learning space, but also coordinates many of our fine and coarse movements. And as such, dopamine is central to many disorders that affect uh, motor control. Specifically, uh, in uh, many neurodegenerative conditions, we see that there's an atrophy um, in the ability to control vo voluntary movement. 
uh, where in the neurotypical sense, voluntary movement again is controlled by these motor centers, which project out into the striatum. Um, and dysregulation of these brain regions uh, lead to uh, Parkinson's disease or Huntington's disease, uh, in which uh, control of these voluntary movements is afflicted, uh, causing a decreased range of motion and mobility, um, and also um, um, uh, uh, dyskinesia, uh, which is, um, uh, again, aberrant movements or difficulty in controlling uh, these motor centers. Specifically with Huntington's disease, and this is the focus of this talk because it is a genetic uh, disease, so it has genetic origins, where the Huntington gene will typically be expressed um, with um, between uh, under 30, 35 uh, glutamine repeats. And this causes expression of healthy Huntington protein. Now, in uh, individuals uh, who have a predisposition to Huntington's disease, what we'll see is that there are expanded repeats in this Huntington gene, causing uh, a larger than normal expression of Huntington protein, uh, which causes then Huntington aggregates, which are molecular, um, molecular interactions between uh, the Huntington proteins that are expressed um, that cause aggregation and uh, agglomeration of these aggregates, specifically in the striatum. These Huntington aggregates um, then make uh, the key players in the striatum, uh, which are the medium spiny neurons, uh, vulnerable uh, in terms of their ability to communicate. And uh, in late stage Huntington disease, we actually see atrophy or, or um, a decrease in the viability uh, of these uh, medium spiny neurons. So again, coming back to this concept um, that it is uh, these, uh, these neurons in the striatum that um, are responsible for many of the um, uh, deleterious consequences of Huntington's disease through uh, their activities in the striatum that propagate out to uh, motor centers and difficulty uh, in controlling motor movements. So the question here is, you know, what is the driver of this progressive uh, dopamine decrease in Huntington's disease? Now, if we think a little bit again about the molecular mechanisms of dopamine regulation in the striatum, uh, we can think about dopamine release being affected uh, broadly speaking. So the literature has previously reported on net decreases uh, in dopamine availability in the striatum as a function of Huntington's disease progression. This can present itself in one of many ways. For example, it could compromise the number of release sites so we could have just a decreased number of release sites, decreased number of healthy release sites um, that somehow compensate in their ability to release dopamine. Or we could have the same number of release sites that all decrease in their ability to, uh, to exercise hosts and therefore communicate with dopamine. And the mechanism uh, of these two is not something that we can um, understand uh, or tease apart unless we have a tool that is able to, to query uh, individual dopamine release sites. Again, concepts uh, such as microdialysis or fast and cyclic photometry uh, will unfortunately average over these two mechanisms, uh, providing um, coarse-grained uh, but not um, synaptic release site information on what causes dopamine dysregulation in Huntington's disease. And so again, implementing um, the uh, NearCap Pro uh, is something that we can do uh, to study how these release sites uh, change as a function of dopamine disease, uh, uh, as a function of Huntington's disease progression. And so specifically what we're asking here um, is when we label the striatal tissue of healthy versus diseased brains, how does dopamine regulation or dysregulation change? Again, we can consider uh, the peak change in intensity of these release sites, um, or we can consider the total number of re release sites, which would constitute healthy versus disease, uh, not just cells, uh, but projections in their ability to signal with dopamine. The way we perform these studies um, if, is through a time course. And so um, we use R62 mouse models of Huntington's disease, which will typically uh, show um, a full disease onset uh, and death uh, 12 weeks post birth. And so the timeline in these animals, uh, which again, in a very shorthand form, matches the timeline um, in, in humans, um, is uh, that aggregates begin to form um, in early, um, uh, in young animals, typically around four weeks. 
Motor symptoms start presenting, um, usually at the nine week beyond time point. Uh, and by 12 weeks, there are evident differences, again, in motor symptom deficits and also in total amount of dopamine that is recovered from the striatum. And so what we do is we use aged match mice that are um, wild type uh, versus uh, genotype for Huntington's disease. And we can perform a rotor rod performance assay. This is going to assess the motor symptoms of these animals in their ability to perform a motor task. And then we can also sacrifice these animals and label the striatal brain tissue with our near cap probe uh, to image um, dopamine signaling in the striatum. And so as you can see here, um, as a function of disease progression, what we're doing here is we're assessing the difference um, in the number of uh, hotspots versus uh, the number of, or versus the intensity with which these hotspots are presenting a uh, dopamine release. So in blue, uh, this is going to represent our wild type animals. Uh, and in orange, this is going to represent our genotype Huntington's disease animals. As you can see here, uh, we're looking at representative snapshots of the striatum labeled with meerkat when we stimulate dopamine release um, at 12 weeks in wild type animals, in which case you can visually appreciate the number of individual dopamine release sites being relatively high uh, to the same experiment performed uh, in Huntington's disease animals. So again, averaging over multiple cohorts, multiple independent trials and multiple animals, uh, we can see that there is initially no statistically significant difference at uh, the four-week time point, uh, nor at uh, the nine-week time point uh, between age-matched wild-type and Huntington's disease. In both cases, both in terms of hotspot number and the, the mean intensity of the sensor, which is a proxy for concentration of dopamine released, we only see statistically significant differences at this 12 week time point uh, in the case of uh, um, uh, the peak DF over F. What's interesting is that we observe a statistically significant difference in the number of hotspots or in the number of active dopamine release sites um, at this uh, initial motor symptom onset. So in this intermediate nine week time point, uh, before we're really able to observe truly significant difference in motor symptoms and before we would observe Huntington aggregate formation or cell death. Why this is interesting is because it points to a previously unmeasurable difference in dopamine modulation that is not specific to the amount of dopamine that's being released, but that rather is specific to the number of active dopamine release sites. And as with many other neurodegenerative conditions, Huntington's disease is also one in which we observe some compensatory effects at these intermediate time points, making it difficult to pinpoint uh, when cell death uh, is occurring and when these deficits in signaling truly arise. And so another uh, assay that we can do to further probe on the mechanism of dopamine dysregulation in uh, wild type versus Huntington's disease uh, is one that uh, involves a change in extracellular calcium. So extracellular calcium is critical for uh, being able to depolarize neurons such that they can release uh, neurotransmitters such as dopamine. So by uh, using a low calcium or a high calcium um, uh, buffer condition, we can basically make these neurons more versus less susceptible to releasing uh, chemicals such as, neuro uh, uh, such as dopamine neurotransmitter. And we can do this again as a function of wild type versus Huntington's disease animal. At four weeks, unsurprisingly, we don't observe any statistically significant differences um, in terms of the trend of forward calcium concentration, whether it be low, medium, uh, or high calcium concentrations uh, at the four-week time point. What this means is that there's no difference in the ability to, to um, promote neurons uh, to release dopamine or incentivize, incentivize neurons to release dopamine. At the 12-week time point, we see a very different story where, again, even as early um, in terms of uh, the 12 week time point, uh, even with intermediate calcium concentrations, we start observing differences uh, in the hotspot number, which again is, is one of the key markers uh, for uh, dysregulation of dopamine in Huntington's disease. Um, we also observe that these trends and these differences are quite a bit higher um, as a function of calcium concentration where calcium is able to linearly increase the amount of uh, the number of dopamine release sites in wild type animals. But in Huntington's disease, adding calcium doesn't seem to help as much or too much. What this means is that in our Huntington's disease animals, even if we 
provide some of the best possible conditions for cells to release neurochemicals, they're not able to compensate uh, despite higher extracellular calcium. Another experiment that we can do, especially because we um, have pharmacology at our disposal, is to start probing alternative mechanisms for dopamine dysregulation um, through, um, through the use of pharmacology. And so um, uh, GERC channels, um, dopamine transporters, um, and even the sensitivity or ability of tyrosine hydroxylase uh, to produce and uh, allow uh, signaling of neurons with dopamine um, can be modulated again uh, by antagonizing uh, D2 autoreceptors uh, through pharmacological, uh, basically inhibition of these receptors. So what sulpiorid is going to do here is it's again, similar to calcium, but through a very different mechanism, going to make these cells more sensitive or more eager to release dopamine if dopamine happens to be present. And so again, repeating the same assay, except now what we're changing is not calcium concentration, but rather the ability or the presence versus absence of sulpuride. Again, here, uh, the blue data represent uh, wild type animals, whereas the orange data represent uh, animals um, that have been genotype positive for Huntington's disease. By bath, applica uh, bath application of sulpuride, uh, what we see um, is that in terms of the modulation of the fluorescence, there is some but moderate difference uh, between wild type and Huntington's disease in terms of the mean uh, peak change in fluorescence of our near cat probe, which again is a proxy for basically dopamine concentration. However, if we look at the regulation of mean hotspot number, so individual dopamine release sites without versus with sulfuride, we see a much greater difference uh, in the blank versus sulfuride condition, and also a much greater net difference in the mean number of hotspots that are added uh, in wild type versus Huntington's disease. So again, what this suggests is that uh, for wild type tissues, for wild type dopamine release sites, um, they can be promoted to release dopamine much more easily through antagonism uh, of D2 autoreceptors with sulpuride uh, versus the case of Huntington's disease, in which case antagonism of these D2 autoreceptors has very moderate uh, effects or very moderate change in the ability for release sites to be able to release dopamine that, that uh, wasn't there in the first place. And so to further confirm this hypothesis, what we can also do um, is take a measurement of dopamine uh, hotspot fidelity. So what I mean by fidelity is if a hotspot uh, were to, for example, be present in stimulation one, if we allow the tissue to recover, but then stimulate the exact same tissue uh, again, we would expect a high fidelity hotspot to show up again and again across different stimulations. Again, by looking at the exact same region, the exact same tissue, the exact same number of hotspots, a low fidelity hotspot would be one that is not present in most stimulations except for one. And a medium fidelity hotspot would be one that, for example, appears in a second stimulation and third, but that wasn't present in the first. So this is what I mean uh, when I uh, say hotspot fidelity. And this is something that, again, we can query using uh, Nearcat as a probe to assess whether the same hotspots are able to release dopamine again and again and again, and how this might be different in wild type versus disease animals. And so here are the data for that experiment. Again, here we are uh, using sulfuride to antagonize D2 autoreceptors and asking the question pre versus post versus post again, how, how high fidelity are the hotspots that we're seeing? Again, uh, here in uh, wild type animals, um, at uh, the 12 week time point, what we're seeing uh, is that uh, the, the proportion of hotspots that are high fidelity is much higher uh, than in Huntington's disease. What these data suggest um, in combination with, all, with, all, with our sulfuride uh, antagonism study um, is indeed that hotspots that disappear in Huntington's disease are truly unable to signal with dopamine through an inhibition or an inability to release dopamine altogether, as opposed to um, a, a compensatory uh, type of uh, uh, mechanism uh, in which these hotspots would be uh, less stimulatable, um, but um, below some threshold of, of sensitivity.
And so the implications that this has uh, in closing for uh, therapeutic time points, which is uh, a topic of ongoing investigation in my lab, um, is at what time points would it then make sense to intervene with therapeutics in a disease such as Huntington's disease? Um, so in collaboration with the Schaefer Lab here at UC Berkeley and the Nance Lab at the University of Washington, we're asking this question um, by attempting the delivery of therapeutics at uh, this new potential therapeutic time point, uh, which occurs prior to the observation of dopamine cell death. Specifically, uh, we are packaging either uh, uh, um, uh, chemical um, uh, drugs or um, siRNA-based uh, therapies, um, either into AAVs or into nanoparticles that can cross the, bl uh, the blood-brain barrier uh, to deliver some of these therapies um, specifically in uh, different brain regions. Assessing both the time points and the spatial distributions where these therapies might have the greatest effects, um, and um, also um, the the reason nanoparticles uh, for the delivery of these therapeutics is is um, is an area of investigation. Uh, again, is because of some of the potential um, uh, recalcitrance of um, the use of uh, viral based technologies such as AAVs uh, for clinical use and clinical practice. Altogether, um, with these therapeutic interventions and with what is now known with regards to dopamine deficits, and the timing of those deficits, and specifically the reason for those deficits, um, we are in a much better place to assess whether these therapeutics um, are going to be efficacious. Uh, we are in a much better place to assess whether alleviation of motor symptoms or um, the lack of aggregate formation um, is a symptom versus a um, a, a core driver of the disease. Um, and by being able to assess the molecular mechanisms on the level of individual synapses, uh, we can better understand how it is that these therapeutic, therapeutic interventions uh, are indeed uh, going to um, cause alleviation of the symptoms and perhaps even reversal of the disease by intervening at earlier time points. And so in terms of future questions that we're focusing on in conjunction with the delivery of these therapeutics are, again, how are these release sites lost or disabled and how can they be best recovered? Because as I've shown uh, in today's talk, it's likely that assessing net dopamine or total dopamine in somewhere like the striatum, especially with a biphasic disease, is going to be a challenging proxy or challenging measure of these therapeutics. Specifically, um, can our um, approaches for therapeutic intervention uh, cause or rescue behavioral effects? I think this is a core, again, question that, that we all have, um, and it's uh, a difficult one to, to answer mechanistically uh, without knowledge about how individual release sites are being affected. And lastly, is release site loss reversible with these therapeutics? This is something that we all hope to be uh, the case or hope to be true. Um, with regards to the timeline for motor symptom onset, this is usually preceded by neuronal cell death, which is usually preceded by the inability of these neurons to signal through dopamine modulation in the first place. So we're hoping that by focusing on the earliest possible um, um, presentation of a disease phenotype, uh, we might be able to uh, best um, have a shot at reversing uh, as opposed to just masking uh, release site loss. And so with that, I would uh, like to thank the scientists that have contributed to this work, again, specifically um, Professor Leila, uh, Linda Wilbricht, uh, who performed, um, helped us perform many of the uh, initial testing and validation of this probe in animal models. Um, Professor Le Leila Vukovic, who contributed molecular dynamics and uh, quantum mechanical simulations that I did not show, but were uh, absolutely critical for the development of these probes, uh, and for our ongoing collaborations uh, in the NANCE lab at University of Washington and the Schaefer lab here at UC Berkeley uh, in the development, testing, and implementation of AV-based AV uh, siRNA therapies for Huntington's disease. And with that, I would uh, be glad uh, to uh, address any questions. Nope, having a bit of trouble hearing. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Laundry. Great presentation. I hope our audience enjoyed the presentation as much as I did. Now, without further delay, let's get to our Q&A section. <laughs> 
so we have the first question here. That is, what would be the duration of action of an SNRA after one administration? And are there any strategies to increase that? Thank you, Iris, for the question. That's a great question. Um, so I think the, the question with regards to an AAV-based delivery, um, the, the first thing to consider is whether um, the delivery integrate the delivery of an AV based vector that is coding for an siRNA would be integrating or not. So if it's an integration based vector, um, then of course we should be prepared for constitutive expression of the siRNA and therefore the therapeutic uh, over the course of at least, uh, maybe not that animal's lifetime, but at least of that neuron's lifetime, which might be sufficient for reversal uh, of disease time course, especially if the therapeutic intervention is, is performed as soon as we start observing uh, differences in dopamine modulation. If it's a non-integrating um, vector, um, which is for regulatory and perhaps safety applications often preferred, um, that is, again, something that we would need to test in terms of the number of doses and repeat doses that would be needed. Um, and of course, whenever we're talking about AAV injections to somewhere like the striatal tissue in, in brain, that is a very deep region, um, repeat administration is often not, um, not the preferred mode of action. So from a clinical perspective, um, I, I hesitate to, to, to say that, that a non-integrating approach would be preferable. The nanoparticle-based delivery approach that I, uh, that I talked about or that I alluded to, um, that is uh, we're currently working on now, um, is one that would be deliverable through systemic administration. So in animals, what we'd be testing is a tail vein injection. The clinical translation of that would be um, uh, an IV drip or an injection. Um, in which case the nanoparticles would go through the blood-brain barrier and carry the siRNA directly to afflicted tissues. Our preliminary data suggests that we do have nanoparticles that can cross the blood-brain barrier and also internalize into both neurons and microglia in the striatum, which is really exciting. Um, we don't yet have that study repeated in Huntington's disease animals specifically, uh, but that is the next step of, of that study. So in that case, uh, with regards to Iris's question about duration of the siRNA therapy post-administration, if the administration is a simple, a simple uh, injection into the bloodstream, um, there it would be much more feasible for repeat administration as often as needed to alleviate symptoms. And that I'm sure would have some patient-to-patient -patient variability as well. Okay, thank you so much for the wonderful answer. And our second question is, is there any benefit of using the siRNA over ASO or shRNA in Huntington disease treatment, please? Yeah, I think, um, so the, the, the main, I guess, the practical benefit of using siRNA um, is that we um, already have um, kind of particle deliverers for it, right? So we have AVs. Um, specifically that are compatible um, in striatal brain tissue. Um, we have, uh, again, uh, viral vectors that are compatible with our siRNA-based approaches um, for which we would need to kind of uh, start from scratch in terms of de developing adeno or lentivirus-based techni uh, techniques for uh, shRNA. Um, and uh, in terms of, uh, again, being able to induce knockdown, uh, constitutive uh, knockdown or inducible knockdown, um, the tunability that we have with regards to where and when, in what cells and at what time points um, in our hands has been more straightforward with siRNA. Um, so that's the reason that we've moved forward with siRNA. The last consideration of the last reason to, to, I guess, the benefit of using siRNA is that um, for the nanoparticle-based approaches, so non-viral-based approaches that we've worked on, um, siRNA is more easily complexed from a chemical standpoint into the polymeric nanoparticles that we'd be using for systemic delivery. Um, so for, for all of those reasons, um, the, the way forward that we've been exploring most heavily has been with siRNA. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, the third question is that to deliver the siRNA for Huntington disease treatment, would the nanoparticle require any specific modification or conjugation to increase the efficacy or specificity, please? Yeah, so this actually 
uh, piggybacks nicely over Jerry's question. Um, so when using um, nucleic acids that have appreciable secondary structures, such as a hairpin structure, um, chemical modification, heavy chemical modification is often needed of the RNA to be compatible with the nanoparticle. Uh, in the case of siRNA, um, at least the sequences that have been um, efficacious um, in our hands in um, uh, R62 animal models for Huntington's disease, um, those are sequences that are quite uh, thermodynamically flexible and so can be conjugated into, into lipid-based nanoparticles quite well, um, or polymeric nanoparticles. Um, so, um, no chemical modification of the siRNA is needed, perhaps with the exception of an, of an addition of a poly A tail to avoid degradation of the RNA. But what we're also seeing is that the nanoparticles that we're using for delivery help protect uh, the RNA from degradation um, in, in uh, ex vivo serum conditions. Uh, so it's possible that we might be able to get away with uh, no modification of the siRNA, uh, but usually the addition of, of a poly A tail um, minimally, if any, affects the, the efficacy of uh, knockdown. All right, thank you so much. We learned a lot from the presentation and your answers. Thank you so much for share, sharing so much with us. And uh, I think that's all for today. Uh, for our audience, please note that the Creative Ball Labs regular, uh, regularly invites brilliant experts uh, regularly invite brilliant experts in the field of life science and biotechnology to present their most recent findings in our webinar series. Dr. Landry is one of them and it's our honor to have her today. Um, please visit our website often and subscribe to our social media so that you won't miss our upcoming webinars. And that's it for today. Thank you everyone. And especially thank you Dr. Landry for joining us and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye.